Hi, today we're going to be looking at using our studio to run a power analysis, what we call a power analysis. And power analysis is relevant to our statistics section on study design because it can help us to determine what our sampling effort needs to be for a given study. Now it's important that you start to have some ideas about your study before you do a power analysis so that you have some idea of how, what the level of differences you're expecting to find and, um, and, and sort of what your research question is going to be and to think about how you might set up a study design, what kinds of statistical tests you're going to use. A power analysis is um, a type of analysis that people use to determine how likely it is that they um, fail to reject a null and commit what we call type two error. So type two error is failing to reject a null hypothesis. And so I like to think of that as type two error is saying that something isn't true when it actually is true. Type one error is, the, is a different kind of error. It's when you actually reject a null hypothesis and you shouldn't. And so I think of that as saying that something is true when it really isn't. Um, scientists um, try to avoid committing type one error. They try to avoid committing all the types of error, but type two error is really actually fairly common. Um, it doesn't mean it's good, but the way that we set up our statistical tests makes it actually pretty difficult to reject a null hypothesis. You have to be sure but beyond a reasonable doubt before you'll reject a null hypothesis and say that what you observed is true. However, there are lots of times where you make some observations, you think you see a pattern, you go out and you collect data and you run a test and you can't reject your null hypothesis. Um, your p-value turns out to be something larger than 0.05 and you can't reject it. Now that might happen because in reality, the pattern you thought you observed when you actually went out and did a standardized um, uh, study and you eliminated um, as much observer influence as possible, you used randomization methods, it actually turned out there really wasn't a pattern. Um, but it's also really common that in reality there is a pattern but you haven't collected enough samples or your study design isn't set up to really detect differences at the magnitude that you would need to detect um, given the amount of time in your study. So a power analysis tells us how likely it is that we're making that second type of error or that we haven't collected enough samples. And so that's why it's gonna be useful. It's useful to do one before you actually go out and do your study um, because you can use an estimate of power to actually um, get an estimate of what your sample size should be. So in our studio, um, you'll see it is set up, um, you, you've, you've previewed it before. Um, I use it slightly differently than some people. A lot of people will code in the console area here, down here of our studio. I tend to type in code up here in the source editor. The code that you type in is the same in both windows, so you can choose which one you want to use. It's a little bit easier in the source editor to correct um, errors, but there's, there's not a lot of difference um, between these two windows. The first thing you need to make sure you do before you try to do a power analysis is to make sure that the appropriate package is installed on your version of R. And um, you'll see here, there's a section, a window that includes a tab that says packages. And this is showing me the packages that I have already loaded into R. Um, I have already installed Power, the program Power, PWR, which is what we need for power analysis. But if you haven't yet, you just click this icon that says install and you type in PWR and you set, click, then click install and you, R will access the correct site um, for downloading and installing the Power package onto your version of R. You may have to close and reopen our studio. So I'm not gonna do that right now, but you can do that, install it, you reopen it, and you should see this library that's called PWR. And so before you begin that analysis, you click PWR and you'll see down here, there's this code that says library parentheses power. And that's just saying it has loaded that library. It's ready to conduct a power analysis. 
So I'm going to go up here into the source editor and I'm going to start typing um, code for power analysis. And so I start by typing PWR. And you'll see when you start to type these codes that if you're typing them correctly, you'll get lots of options for um, the kinds of tests that you're going to be wanting to run. In the case that we're using for the statistics lab that I use as an example, um, this was an example using Pacific Rins and their relationship to um, different ages of log four. So we would predict that Pacific Rins are much less abundant in newly logged forest forest that was logged say five years ago, and then probably find some more in medium age log forest, say 20 year old log forest, and um, they would be at their maximum abundance in old growth forest. And this is because of their relationship with dead woody debris and what we tend to see with those debris loads in different ages of forest. So that's the prediction. Um, and that's a kind of question that um, would be answered with the design that would use an analysis of variance to test these differences or ANOVA. You'll hear me say ANOVA a lot. And that is a type of analysis where you can look for differences between two, um, three or more groups. If you're using two groups, you can use something called a t-test, very similar to an analysis of variance. It's a little computationally um, more straightforward and simple, but um, analysis of variance is for comparing means of three or more groups. So I'm gonna want to do power dot ANOVA test. And so I'm hovering my mouse over that here. And you'll see that there is um, an explanation, kind of a brief explanation of that test when you hover over it. And so it's telling us you have to enter the following parameters. You have to enter K, and K is the number of groups you have. And so in the example I'm providing, there are three groups. There's young forest, medium age forest, and old forest. You could have four or five groups if you have a study design where you're looking at that many groups. Um, you need to, Enter, you, you can leave one of these blank. So there's a whole list of parameters and you can leave one blank and R will make the computation and fill in that blank value. And in the case of what we're doing here, we're leaving in blank. N equals the sample size. And in the case of R, it's the sample size per group. And so when, it, when we see the number that we get, it will be, that's how many per group that we have. And so in my case, I'll have to multiply that number by three. F in this case is what we call the effect size. And um, that is a function of how different I think my groups are gonna be. Do I think there's gonna be double as many Pacific Rins in a medium age forest versus a young forest and then double again in an old forest? Well, I would have to look at the literature. I would have to go out and make some preliminary observations to think that that's reasonable. And if that is the case, I'm gonna to expect to have what we would call a pretty large F, if in this term, it's a little F, it's not an F test, but it's, it's, a, it's a pretty large effect size. And lots of systems, we're actually guessing that we're gonna see a smaller effect um, of one variable on another. Um, but a general rule of thumb for effect size is that a large effect size is a number that ranges from zero to one. And so um, a rule of thumb is a large effect size is 0.4. And then a small effect size is 0.1. And a medium effect size is 0.25. And so I think it's useful to enter, to run this analysis three times with those three effect sizes and just see what you could be dealing with given the system that you're looking at. Um, and then, then the next parameter is sig dot level, and that's your significance level. So at what level do you determine, are you saying this is a significant result? And um, the default is 0 0.05, as you can see. And um, that's, that's fine for all of the, eco, uh, all of the tests we'll basically be running in, in this program. And then power, so the value for power. And again, the power value, is almost, it's not exactly the inverse of the significance value, but how confident, think about how confident on a scale from zero to one, zero being not confident at all, and one being absolutely without a doubt confident, which you never really are in science, um, but how confident are you, do you want to be that you have, that if you fail to reject that null, that it's because there really isn't a pattern. 
And I think a good rule of thumb is you want to be fairly confident. So a, a power value of 0 0.9, I think, is, is going to be the good rule of thumb for you to be using. Okay. And so we're going to go ahead and set this up. I'm going to type power ANOVA test or enter this in. And I'm going to type in K equals three for three groups. Okay. N equals, and I leave that blank because that's what I want um, R to give back to me. F equals, I'm going to start off with the large effect size, 0 0.4. SIG level, there we go, significance level equals 0 0.05. And then power, equals 0 0.9. And so when I do this in the source editor, I instead of just typing enter, I have to hit control enter to get the output. And you can see the output pops up in the console. I'm going to scroll up just a little bit because it's useful to make sure that you've it. The console has recorded what you or that you typed everything that was supposed to be typed in the correct way. Yes, three groups. I left sample size blank. My effect size is the large one. Significance level of 0 0.05 and power of 0.9. Okay, and so this is the output. Okay, and again, it's, you should see that everything that you typed in stays the same. The only thing that's new is that it has now told me what my sample size needs to be. It's 27.38838. And, and you'll notice down here at the bottom, it says, note, N is the number in each group. Okay, N is the number in each group. So in this case with RStudio, you have to multiply that number by three or by K, whatever your group size is. And so in this case, I'm going to round up just to be conservative. I'm going to say that I need to be taking 28 samples or 28 point counts in my case in each group. And so 28 times three is going to be my total sample size for the project. That seems reasonable. 30 is what we recommend as a minimum rule of thumb. And so in this case, with a large effect, you're looking at a sample size that's very close to 30 per group. Okay, in this case, something close to 90. And so that's the output put for a large effect size. So when I'm really sure something's, some relationship is happening, something's happening. Now I'm not 100% sure that that actually is what I'm gonna find. So I'm gonna go back up here and I'm just gonna modify the effect size. And I'm gonna type in the general basic rule of thumb for a medium sort of effect size, which is 0.25. And I'm gonna uh, run this analysis again, okay? And again, you can see that I've typed in the variables like I expected. The only thing I changed was this, the effect size. And so here's the output with those values in there. The only thing that's changed again is my sample size, sample size per group. If I have only a medium effect size, so there's a difference, but there's not this huge order of magnitude or doubling sort of difference between the different habitat types. It's a smaller difference, still significant, but smaller. Then I'm going to have to collect 69 point counts per group. So let's just round up to 70. So 70 times three, uh, that's 210 point counts. That's kind of a lot. Okay. Um, and so that's something good, something to know. Um, and I have to start thinking, how am I going to make that work in a period of about two weeks? Um, and then just to make myself depressed, maybe, I don't know, but just to see what would be a worst case scenario, if there's just a tiny effect, okay? So the small effect size is 0.1, what would happen? Okay, so if I do that and run the analysis one more time with a tiny effect, if only a tiny small effect, say from the very youngest forest to this close to old growth, we're just seeing like a fraction more Pacific Wren, higher, fraction higher Pacific Wren density. To detect that difference, you'd have to be collecting 422 point counts per habitat type. So that's way over 1200 point counts. 
it just wouldn't be feasible. And so what I'd have to say in this kind of system, I, I wouldn't abandon this question, but I would say if the effect is really small, the difference between the densities is really small, I'm just not going to be able to detect it. Okay, that's what I would say to myself in this case, because 420, uh, you know, 1,200 to 1,300 point counts is that's just not feasible within a reasonable time period unless you have a whole um, team of people who are already really well trained in that method to go out and sim simultaneously conduct those point counts. And that's just not going to be the case for most studies. So um, I think I would be have to be content with my, let me scroll up and see if I have, yeah, with my best case scenario being close to 30 surveys per habitat and my worst case being about 70 surveys per habitat. And I think it would be reason, it's reasonable to plan for the 70 and then continue to enter your data and analyze it as you go. Um, and you can even rerun your power analysis as you start to collect data. And so something to think about when you're setting this study up is maybe start to plan for a sample size closer to 70, or maybe you're gonna say, well, maybe I'll try for 50 because there's effect sizes between 0.25 and 0.4. You could put every number in between 0.25 and 0.4 and, and sort of see where that's gonna take you. But you could set it up to think, okay, could I, could I do that many surveys, 210 in, in two weeks, given that you need to do your surveys at dawn, so between about 5.30 to 8.30 or 9 in the morning, you need to space your surveys out by a certain number of meters. You have to actually take some time to run the surveys. Um, how many could you get done in a day and how many days can you do it? That's, that's really the, the number you would have to, to look at. And then hope that there's no rain or other heavy wind or something that would interfere with your ability to do the surveys. If it looks like you're gonna be getting towards something needing to collect more like 210 samples, it's, I would recommend that when you start to design your survey, that you're making sure that each day that you go out, you're going to the, a different habitat type. So one day you're going to the young forest, the second day you're going to the medium forest, and the third day you're going to the old, so that you cycle through, so that something happens, like a lot of rain, or something sort of backfires. You have collected some samples and close to an equivalent number of samples in each habitat type. So that's where this something like this power analysis can be really useful. Um, if you're dealing with um, a situation where even the medium size, and so we're kind of on the cusp here with this study, where like a medium effect would actually um, be almost unfeasible, it's useful to start to think, well, how can I modify things a little bit to make sure I get some kind of result? And um, collecting habitat data is, is something that people always need to do when they're doing bird surveys. And so thinking of a smart metric for collecting habitat data, we mentioned dead woody debris for sure, um, will help to at least reveal some insight on anything that you do or don't observe. And so that is power analysis in R.